Well, good morning. We are just back from a week at the Grand Canyon in Zion National Park. Uh, we towed a camper and um, did the iconic family vacation with our two boys. It was wonderful. And nothing like being away from the family of God to make you love them and miss them anew. So, so glad to be with you. So happy to um, see you and worship God with you this morning, even in tender times of goodbye, uh, to celebrate the good and new things that God is doing. As we jump into the Word and uh, into our new series through the Bible, as we are looking at the Gospel of Mark, I was reflecting while I was away on a conversation I had back in the winter of this year with somebody that um, was a first of its kind for me. Somebody asked me, not cynically, but, ju- but earnestly, what if it were able to be definitively disproven? What if what the Bible teaches, what you've built your life on and what you stand in front of people and talk about every week were somehow to be incontrovertibly disproved? Like Jesus' body was found, DNA evidence, just for the sake of discussion, made it completely clear that he didn't rise from the dead. And thus, what you believe and what you stand on with regard to the truth of Scripture um, were, weren't there any longer. What would you do? And I, I thought about that, um, and then I thought a lot more about it after the conversation, but I was, frankly, a little surprised at what came out of me, uh, and, and then later, how deeply I agreed with myself. <laughs> do you ever have that moment where you respond in impulse, and then you're like, do I think that? And then, and then you're, you're sometimes pleasantly surprised to find that, that you agree with you. What I said was, I'm not sure I would do anything different. And he said, but wouldn't you be living a lie? Wouldn't you be propagating a falsehood? And I said, here's the thing. Even if this is all there is, if if it ends and we turn back to dust and, and our candle is snuffed out and that's it, I have tried enough life in different ways and seen enough people following different paths to become convinced that Jesus's way is the best way. Even if there's nothing afterward. Even if he's a a, a set of ideas on a page, they're the best ideas I've found. His ideas have proven true in my life. It's, 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 It's incredibly central and meaningful, don't get me wrong, that he lives. But if he didn't, his ideas have led to losing my life to find it. Peace, joy, fruitfulness, purpose in my life. I don't think I would do anything different. I mean, I might change the phrasing a bit, but I am convinced that Jesus' way is the best way to live. And I was able to go to sleep at night uh, a little more peacefully after wrestling through that thing. Now, I realize even introducing from the pulpit the concept in a church that the whole thing might be a sham is like, ooh, wait, am I allowed to say that? But don't, let's not pretend like I'm not addressing something out loud that every one of us hasn't thought. If you haven't, you should. You should think it through. Jesus didn't ask us to check our brains at the door. He gave us our brains, right? So what if? Is this true? Faith comes by filling in holes of uncertainty, doubt, and fear. When we go through loss, when we face existential crises in our culture, maybe we experience the death of a loved one, we have to ask these questions again. We're in the book of Mark, and we're beginning at the beginning. We're going to go through Mark over the course of the next eight weeks, two chapters per week. We're not going to read every verse in the pulpit. We're going to read every verse, if you're willing, uh, during the course of the week. And then we're going to highlight a theme or an idea from the two chapters that we've read together over the course of the preceding week. So as Pastor Neil invited you to last week. I hope you've read with us Mark chapter 1 and 2. If you haven't, plenty of time to catch up. Um, And you can jump in with us starting today in Mark chapter 1. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. And so it begins, right in the middle of the story, 
full of action and straight to the point. Our series is going through the Bible book by book over the course of a lifetime. This summer, we're taking on the book of Mark. It's one of four accounts of Jesus' life, of course. We call those the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Many stories exist in parallel. Some are discrete to one or another Gospel. Mark has the fewest discrete stories. It's the shortest and the most action-packed of the four. There is a reason why, I believe, the Holy Spirit inspired four accounts by four different writers of Jesus' life that are harmonious and that provide texture and complementary detail and, and themes. We're going to look at what God intended us to understand through the keyhole of Mark with the rest of Scripture in mind by way of context. This series, as is the case with our series, is derived from and serves to elucidate and drive our values drawn from the Word of God. And so I just want to review those with you. Our values are predicated upon our mission, which is to live with Jesus, live in family, and live on mission. This is what we understand to be the way of life in following Christ. And so three values correlate with each of those objectives. To live with Jesus fleshes out in this way. We orient our lives around God. We embrace the centrality of Scripture, and that's the one that we're going to come back to and focus on over the next several weeks. And then we engage whole life transformation. That's the value that drove the series we just finished in the month of May on understanding emotional health and its integral importance to spiritual maturity. Then living in family breaks down this way. We pursue authentic relationships. We build diverse community and we cherish the gathering of believers. This is a big deal. Then living on mission looks like this. We cultivate kingdom influence. We're going to talk about that in September. Uh, our work isn't secular stuff. It's the most sacred stuff there is because we're in the middle of it. Christ in you is filling all things everywhere with himself. We're going to talk about that this fall. We care for the poor and marginalized. And back in February, we talked about that, looking at Matthew 25, zoomed in on that text. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And then lastly, we answer Christ's global mandate. We're a missions church because Jesus' church is a global missions church. So today we're continuing and diving in in earnest to our value, we embrace the centrality of Scripture. Now, embracing the centrality of Scripture has a range of understandings, and indeed, there is a, a range of theological specific points along a continuum that probably undoubtedly exists in this room. And where typically, over the course of my Christian life, we in the church have started from the zoomed in spot and then worked our way out. I want to start zoomed out and work our way in. We've started from the scriptures being inerrant or infallible, authoritative, and there's value in each of these understandings. There's shades of difference and nuances of meaning and whole church denominations and traditions have arisen around those differences right? Carving out their existence over against the other Baptist denomination or whatever based on their understanding of infallibility or their understanding of inerrancy. And people have fought over that for centuries. We've committed horrible atrocities as the church in the name of this truth, right? Because we believe scripture to be, to mean what it says and be authoritative and God, you know, gathers the world from its four corners, when somebody like Copernicus said, no, the world's round, people wanted to kill him. And people burned and stoned and exiled and tortured scientists for saying that literal scriptural truth is not valid where we've come to understand that maybe it's the, the literary mode in which it was written. It's, it's, the, it's the metaphoric or poetic four corners of the earth. Nobody's arguing that any longer. We talked about that with the heliocentrism of the modern scientific understanding, right? Prior to that, we imagined the world, the earth to be at the center and everything to revolve around us. And when scientists started to uh, understand that that's not the case, they were persecuted. 
right? So how we understand the authority, the importance of Scripture plays out in vast, vast swaths of our Christian living and our culture. And so we embrace the centrality of Scripture. There is room in our understanding here at Denver United of Scripture's centrality for your inerrancy, your infallibility, your authority, however you, wherever you find yourself starting, there's room for that. It's about where we're going, which is to know God by knowing Scripture. Here's why we embrace the centrality of Scripture. Jesus said to the Pharisees as they were in the act of missing the forest for the trees, you know, he said, you search the Scriptures carefully. They study them. They memorized the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. You talk about a Sunday school homework assignment. They were committed to God's word. He said, you search the scriptures thinking they'll give you life. This is in John 6. But don't you realize the scriptures point to me? And so we embrace the centrality of scripture because we embrace the calling, the invitation to live with Jesus. Scripture is central because Scripture is the central, the primary way that we know Jesus. It reveals Jesus. So it's possible to build a church and a church tradition around authority of Scripture and end up with like a permuted religion that's like Bibleism. Anyone been a part of a Bibleism tradition? There's like where the Scripture is the hill to die on. That's the point. Now, don't get me wrong. The Scripture is centrally important in our understanding of living for Christ, but Jesus is the point. Scripture is central, confusing as it can be, vast, multi-layered, multifaceted. It's central because it reveals Jesus. It points to him. And so that's why I don't need to understand how it works fully to know that it works. Like gravity kept people stuck to the face of the planet for millennia before anyone discovered the mathematics behind it, right? The word of God has continued to bear fruit in every season, be true and useful for teaching, correction, reproof, and godly living long before somebody recognized its authority, centrality, inerrancy, infallibility, or otherwise. While we're in our ivory towers dickering over words, It's continued to draw people to the heart of God, point people to Jesus, reveal the truth, and lead us in relationship with God. It's continued to be living, active, powerful, sharper than a sword, accomplishing the purpose for which God sent it long before we came to believe any of those things was so. So here's the thing. Let's come down a little bit in our self-assurance and approach the scripture with a a measure of intellectual curiosity and humility. That's not undoing God's authoritative word. But let's hold loosely the tradition that we bring to this room this summer around what that means, and let's look for God together. I'm not looking to deconstruct your faith. Don't get me wrong in case you're starting to tense up. I'm asking, can we try to read the Bible for all it's worth? That's what I want us to do together this summer, such that even if for the sake of discussion, some of us aren't convinced, or let's take that argument or the discussion I had with that friend back in the winter. Let's say it could be proven to be false. I believe there is value in it even so. Now, I don't believe it is false. And I think as we seek, we will find, as people have done for thousands of years, And God's truth will continue to compound and self-reveal. But let's start not from the zoomed-in point of knowing exactly what it is and having a lasso around the Word of God and self-reinforcing our doctrine around it. Let's start from the zoomed-out point of, I want to know God. I'm going to work my way into understanding whether the Scripture is inerrant or infallible and how all that works and its authority and what about the contradictions and, you know, what about the, the Nephilim and all the all that stuff. Let's, let's just hold that loosely and start from, God, we want to know you. And we have seen enough, experienced enough to know that coming at you from the point of your word is going to lead us to know you. And then 
figure out the rest as we go. Can we do that? All right, that's the goal here this summer. Mark chapter one, the story continues in verse 14. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Mark's tone and pace is direct. It's brisk. Mark is a writer of action. He says to the readers, in effect, hey, God's been preparing. Jesus has come. Are you ready? And so that's our title this morning. Verse one in the traditional translations renders the Greek reliably as a sentence fragment. Did you know that Mark actually doesn't begin with a complete sentence? I believe this is on purpose. The beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, the son of God. There's no verb. It's, it's just, it's getting straight to the point. It's all action. Perhaps part of this uh, has to do with the fact that its author is John Mark, a very practical go-getter of a guy, a guy that caused Barnabas and Paul to split because of the depth of feeling around him and because of this, perhaps the strength of his personality. A guy, though, that Paul said in his old age in prison, send me Mark because he's useful to my ministry. The guy gets it done. Most Bible historians and scholars believe that Mark's primary source for his gospel was Peter, which makes Mark make sense. When you read this, think of it in a way you're listening to Peter's account of Jesus's life. It's, it's forward in the saddle. It's, it's go get him, right? One day, verse 16, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Well, Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I'll show how you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, repairing their nets in a boat. He called them at once and they also followed him, leaving their father in the boat with the hired men. Jesus noticed, according to Mark's gospel account, he came at last and they followed him at once. And there is an urgency and a definitiveness. There is a, 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 a line in the sand and that's a sort of literary context for, uh, for the format that we're going to experience as we read through Mark's gospel together. These four guys, Jesus approaches, says, come follow me. And they drop their nets, literally leave their fishing boats in the water and just come follow him. And we take this for granted because we all who grew up in the church grew up singing like Peter, James, and John in the sailboat or whatever. And so we're like, of course they did. But normal people don't do that, right? We go through an interview process. We give two weeks notice. We ask for references. There's a whole process. We think about, we, we seek counsel. Maybe these guys were just young and immature. Maybe they were all imbalanced. Or maybe there was something more. There was a clear sense of expectation. Mark doesn't give you as much of the backstory as the others, but there was a long path of expectation for the Messiah's coming. And people had been seeking him. We're gonna hear about John the Baptist in a moment. John the Baptist had disciples and they were all trained on the Messiah. John said he's coming and they were looking, they were waiting. There was a sense of preparation, a sense of expectation that was baked into first century Jewish culture. They had come through some rough years. They were suffering again, this time under the hands of the Roman Empire and they wanted their Messiah to arrive. Right away, Mark links his account to Isaiah, giving historicity to this expectation. This isn't just a recent thing. You know, the zealots who wanted to overthrow Rome. This was hundreds of years of expectation in the making. God's long-awaited plans, could they be happening? That's what maybe is going on in the minds of these four fishermen. And John the Baptist, he says, springs onto the scene saying, someone is coming soon. Jesus, in his first words that Mark gives us, says, the kingdom of God is near. There is expectation. Many had been waiting, and when he called, they responded because they were ready. So Jesus starts preaching and healing, and soon enough, he's mobbed. 
Mark fast forwards through much of his, all of his early life and much of his early ministry to get to his so-called year of popularity in chapter two, the house where Jesus was staying was so packed with visitors There was no more room even outside the door while Jesus was preaching the word of God to them. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring Jesus to him because, or couldn't bring him to Jesus rather because of the crowd. So they dug a hole in the roof and they lowered the man on his mat right in front of Jesus. Verse six, but some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? So many were amazed, dazzled, drawn, compelled, and then they saw Jesus heal this man and they were blown away, but some were immediately skeptical. And what you see here right away in chapter two, no sooner has Jesus sprung onto the scene and started to gain a reputation than the seas part. The crowd divides. And we see a theme a theme that carries through the gospel of Mark, emerge. Mark's story highlights differing responses to Jesus. They diverge into two paths or two buckets of response. You see it again in verse 14. Jesus is walking along and he saw Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. You know this story. Jesus says, follow me, be my disciple. Levi got up and followed him and later invited Jesus and his disciples to come to his home for dinner. And he invited his tax collector and disreputable sinner friends. Well, the teachers of religious law saw him eating with these people and asked, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard them, he told, uh, heard this, he told them famously, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. Jesus says, in effect, listen, guys, God loves such scum. They're the point. And you and I, All of us for whom Jesus came, we're all such scum. Some of us just clean up a little better. The Pharisees are the grandest irony because they had anticipated, prepared vigilantly, and watched carefully for the coming of God's Messiah. They had a rigid understanding of what Messiah would do, though. And so sadly, they became a metaphor for ending up on the wrong side of history. So sad if you think about it. I uh, came across a a funny and entertaining article from PC World. And you're like, really? (laughs) Speaking of ironies, you don't think of, unless you're Jonathan Fast, you don't think of funny and entertaining and PC World magazine going together. But this actually was. Here's what the article was called. The worst tech predictions of all time. (laughs) This is great. Okay, how about this one? Television, this is a quote. Television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. So spoke 20th Century Fox movie executive Daryl Zanuck in 1946, the advent of the television. Threatened that it would cut into movie market share. That one did not age well. Or what about Nathan Mirvold? the CTO at the time from Microsoft in 1997. He said, Apple is already dead. (laughs) Or my, I think all of our personal favorites, this one has almost become a household name because of this quote. And this is so sad. Uh, Ken Olson, you've probably read this at some point, founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, a computer company in 1977 said, there is... No reason anyone would want a computer in their home. (laughs) Now, I'm sure Ken Olson did a lot for humanity and probably for the computing industry. He was obviously a smart and capable man, and he probably had a lot of good qualities. But he is known in history singularly for this unfortunately wrong line in the sand. He was on the wrong side of history and he's been lampooned in countless speeches. That's the punchline of so many speeches and TED Talks that it's become a cliche. Ken Olson has become an icon for being on the wrong side of history and that's how the Pharisees were. 
right? They, had, they were the ones that were so carefully preparing for the Messiah's coming, and he came, and they missed the forest for the trees right in front of their face because they were focused on the wrong things. And Mark draws this contrast, the ones who receive Jesus and the ones who reject him in spite of themselves and how their paths diverge until ultimately they lead to very different ends of death and life. It's a theme you'll see all the way through Mark. What if you were on the wrong side of history? Mark's gospel makes it easy to sit in the armchair and laugh at the Pharisees and laugh at the Ken Olsons, but it also holds the mirror up to you and me. And it asks us, what if we were on the wrong side of history? Would, would you know it? You'd like to think you would. I'm not sure I'm smarter than any of those Pharisees or teachers of the law, though. And what if I became informed of it? What if I were presented with that fact? Would I be open to reconsidering? We'll wrap up here. Mark 2, verse 21 these opening chapters culminate with Jesus' first parable. Who would patch old clothing with new cloth, he says? The new patch would shrink and rip away the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. The wine would burst the skins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. This is Jesus' first parable, a form of teaching which would go on to be his go-to club in the bag, right? And a parable is a simple story that taps into everyday life of his hearers and makes a singular point. This was his first parable that Mark records, and perhaps the singular point is elasticity, right? It's difficult for us to make sense of because we don't drink wine out of skins. We don't drink anything out of skins. Um, but the way that they, wine was a big part of their culture, and the way that they contained it was in these containers made of skin. And of course, the old wine skins had had their elasticity exhausted. So they were what engineers would call plastic. They, had, they didn't have any more give, right? So the old wine is done expanding. It's done fermenting. So you put the old wine, you know, the stuff that's been aging forever, that's your good stuff, in the old wineskins because you, you don't need any elasticity. But new wine is still fermenting. It's still, in a sense, growing, expanding. And you put it in new skins, any hearer of Jesus' parable would know because they all did skins. That was part of their thing. It'd be like talking about apps for you. He wouldn't have to explain what an app is, but to somebody who was reading this 2,000 years from now, they'd be like, what's an app? He would, he would rely on your, everybody knowing that, right? That's how the skin thing was. So new skins, they're still stretchy. They haven't ex expanded to the point of exhausting their elasticity. And so something that's still becoming, that's still doing, that's still expanding and growing needs to go into something that's expandable. Jesus is saying, which one are you? Which one are you? Which one are you willing to be? He shows us up to this parable, two different wineskins, if you will. The ones that, man, they had held wine for a long time, but they'd done all the expanding they were gonna do. They knew just the volume of what was to be contained. They kind of had it, had it figured out, right? And then there was these rough around the edges, fishermen and tax collectors and disreputable sinners, man, they were still expanding. They probably hadn't even started to stretch, but oh, they were willing and they were able to contain something that was also going to expand, that needed to expand, that would not be bound. See, that's what Mark's saying. Which one are you? Jesus is here. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ Isaiah and the prophets have told you all along God has a master plan. They've said he's gonna finish what he started. John the Baptist came and said, are you prepared? If not, get prepared. And Mark seems to say, get ready. And man, be on the right side of history. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He's present as full of love and power as he ever was, offering life that is fuller and realer 
and truer. Life that's growing and expanding like still fermenting wine. And Jesus wants to do something new in your life. Here's the question. Will you receive it? Which side of history are you going to land on? Will you receive what Jesus wants to do this summer in your life that is new? Will you let Pastor Neil lead you in his going out? Coming into a time where he has honed his craft. I mean, you heard him preach last week and some of you are like, man, he's better than him. Yeah, yeah, he's good. He, He didn't get the good preacher wand waved over him either. He has worked at it and worked at it like no one I know. And his soul and his maturity, his family, his ability to relate, connect, lead, be emotionally mature. Such that when Jesus said, hey, I want to do something new, he was ready and willing. But man, that wineskin was still stretchy so it can take more wine. Are you ready? Are you willing for what Jesus would do in your life? this summer or will you miss it? Miss it because you weren't ready, like maybe some other fishermen down the shore. Oh, you miss it because you bounded what it could look like, like maybe some of those religious scholars. Or will you miss it because you misunderstood yourself? You know, why would he eat with such scum? Failing to recognize, I am the scum. The disciples left their nets when Jesus came. Maybe not because they were chemically imbalanced either. Maybe because they were ready and they were willing and they recognized that life was for more, was for expansion, and their wineskin was stretchy. You know, those four nameless, faceless friends that cut through somebody's roof so unsociably and lowered a friend in desperate need before Jesus. They didn't have it all figured out. They didn't know he was the son of man or the son of God. They didn't know whether he was casting out demons from the finger of God or power or Beelzebub. They didn't know anything. All they knew is Jesus was there and they were ready and they were willing. What if he asks you to leave your boat? What if he asks you to bring your friend or to tear through a roof What if he asks you to leave the crowd? So begins the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you willing? On the tables in the back as you go out, if you didn't receive one, uh, you'll find, and I'd like to invite you to take one of these reading plans. We did them in paper because there's something real and actual about studying the Bible that way. This is a place for simple notes. If you've got a handsome leather-bound calfskin journal, use that thing. If you don't, um, this works like paper too. And just make, make a few notes. We've, our staff has gone through and included a, a few reflection questions. And you can just write your notes. You don't, these aren't, aren't a test. You don't turn them in. They're not for anybody. Just to engage the text so we can learn how to read the Bible for what it's worth. This week, I invite you to join us in what would be week two, that's Mark three and four. And we suggest a breakup of starting with reading the whole two chapter chunk and then over the course of a couple of succeeding days, um, zooming in on a portion at a time. And the idea is that maybe you don't have time every day or maybe you're reading something else as well, Um, but that's four days in a week that we can dive into the Word of God together. There's Bibles back there, pens and highlighters. I'm a big fan of a Bible that is actual. I know that the Bible is on all of our phones as well, and I use that from time to time, but everything else in the world is on my phone also. So maybe you have the discipline to silence notifications before you read, but the person who needs notifications silenced, this guy, normally doesn't do that. Normally what he does is he's reading the Bible and he sees an alert pop up and then he goes to that thing because that's how we're conditioned. That's why I'm a fan of letting the Word of God be the only thing in, in, in its thing, in its container. 
If you don't have one, we've got some back there. If you don't have one, but it's like, it's like wafer thin pages and super fine leather and it, it has your name embossed in gold and your grandmother would roll over in a grave if she knew you were writing in it, don't write in it. Put it on the shrine on your shelf next to the candle and the picture of your grandmother and leave it there. And take a cheap $2 Bible with non-wafer thin pages that you can write in with a ballpoint pen that no one's gonna roll over in their grave when you do it. It's not gonna rip the pages. Take a highlighter and as you're reading, if something stands out to you or if there's a question, either, wow, that, I'm seeing a new lighter where that's just kind of hitting me. That's hitting different, right? I know. And so that's where I would say, as the kids say, and that's where Rice would look at me as if to say, as the kids said in 2019. But <laughs> as the kids said back in March, that one hits different. It's so hard to keep up with what the kids say. So if it hits different, or if you're like, wait, what are you talking about, Willis? What does that mean? Then just highlight it or underline it or write a little question. And then when you pray, that gives you something to pray about. You just like, Lord, what does that mean? Or wow, that idea, would you cause it to like sink in my heart? And maybe this thing does come alive. Maybe it doesn't, but if it did, that'd be a great way for it to come alive. And then we'll just continue through this over the course of the next eight weeks together. And as we study the word of God and learn its truth, we also take in how to study the word of God and even more importantly, why? That we would embrace together as Jesus leads us the centrality of scripture to our faith. Make sense? You with me? You down? You down, dog? I can tell my dog that you are down. So stand up with me, let's get, I know I'm getting, everyone under 30 is like, please kill me. You're killing me with uncoolness. Stop. I'm going to shrivel. I know it's, it's part of the fun of having teenagers is periodically making them shrivel like slugs from uncoolness. All right, Neil, Katie, you guys making your way out? Good. Uh, we'll just pray and buy them some time to get out there. So no hugging them on the way out. All right. You got to wait till they're out there to hug them. All right, Lord, bless my friends. Would you cause your word indeed to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, Lord? If it's true, we don't need to coerce one another into believing it's so. If it's true, it's true. Let it come alive. Let it do in my friends' lives what it's done in my life. Lord, oh, how I love, how I hunger for the word of God. Lord, how grateful I am that at some point along the way, it switched from being a duty like eating your greens to a, a joy like water when I'm thirsty. Lord, would you cause your word to nourish and strengthen and compel us as we give it our attention. I thank you for my friends and I bless them this week and everything that they face, every challenge they encounter, would you give them strength and wisdom and courage to face it, fill them with faith and let the love of Jesus flow from them into this weary city. I thank you for a group of people that said yes to the calling to be missionaries to a post-Christian generation. Lord, let your light shine through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming to church. Enjoy the beautiful day. Go hug and mob Neil and Katie and have an amazing week.